So why do you think the bourbon captured the attention of the legislature? Probably because they drink it, but whatever. <laughs> I, well, that's that, you're exactly right. Uh, there is all kinds of stories about uh, Abraham Lincoln finding out what General Grant drank, and it was Old Crow. And he wanted to send all of his generals a barrel of whatever Grant drank because Grant was Grant was getting it done, getting it done. So he wanted to to share that. Um, the great compromiser Henry Clay would bring bourbon to to Washington. So a lot of deals were done over bourbon. Welcome to another trip down the bourbon road with your hosts Jim and Randy. So grab a glass of your favorite bourbon and kick back. We would like to thank Tommy and Gwen Mitchell from Loggerheads Home Center for supporting this episode of The Bourbon Road. Find out more about their fine rustic furniture at logheadshomecenter.com. Hey, Randy. Jim. I had some fun. I'm going to tell you what, uh, Brian is uh, just a wealth of knowledge. And, and, and when you read this book, Bourbon Justice, you don't realize how bourbon has really influenced the history of the United States. I mean, from, from branding and trademarking to, you know, the, the whole Bottle and Bond Act, which started the whole USDA thing. And I, amazing. I, I was fascinated. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you can take, you can take any level of, of information out of this book. If you're just a... If you're just a kind of a casual bourbon follower, you can find a lot of great tidbits in there and information on bourbon, talking about bottling bond and some of the things that have gone on. But if you're a real geek and a history buff, there's all kinds of stuff Man, in there. You can dig, you can dig pretty deep into this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So he's he's a wealth of knowledge. Great guy. Great guy. Had fun, a wonderful time today with yeah, him. Yeah. Fun to talk to. You. Fun yeah, to talk so, to. So you. you know, um, he is not only an author. He's an attorney. He's worked in the bourbon field as a, you know, in the legal field. He's also, uh, uh, also going to be in bourbon and beyond this year. He's going to be giving a, giving a talk there as well. Kind of cool. But, but the book is a good read and I really didn't want to read it to start off with. But once I got into this thing, man, I was just, okay, give me to the next chapter. I mean, this is a theme I'm kind of getting from you. So you, you've got your terminal degree, you're a PhD. And you've done yeah, a little that, bit. But that t- makes me want to just not do anything. <laughs> <laughs> you've read all. enough books in your life. I've read enough. I don't care. It's like, just leave me alone, you know? And so you just don't, uh, you just don't want to take tests. I so this whole bourbon steward thing's like, wait a minute, guys. <laughs> but I, I, I will do that just because bourbon is something I'm interested in, yeah. you know? And I, I would do that. Um, but uh, yeah, this, this book was actually pretty good um, to me. The tasting notes were great. I thought way to, you know, I, I agree with him. That was a great way to, to uh, kind of break up, you know, some of the laws and stuff. Yeah. But some of there's some hidden stories in some of these lawsuits yeah. that are really, really interesting. Yeah. And if you're a bourbon geek out there, yeah, man, this is the book for you. Yeah. I had fun. I enjoyed it. Uh, I really liked the book a lot. It was great to meet Brian. Great to have a couple of pours with him. Oh, yeah. Good and, pours. Uh, both, hof- both good pours. Hopefully we'll get together again sometime and do something a little less formal. Uh, sounds good. Like All a right. third third pour. Third pour. There sounds go. good. All right. All right, Ring. Let's get to it. it sounds good. Hello, I'm Jim Shannon. I'm Randy Minnick. And we are the Bourbon Road. And we are in Louisville, Kentucky today. And we are with Brian Hara. Brian is the author of Bourbon Justice. And we're going to get more into the book later, but Randy, what do you think? What do you think we drink some bourbon? All right, welcome to the show, Brian. Well, you thank ready? you. you thank ready you. To try. I'm ready. Thank you uh, both for having me. I look forward to this. Yeah. So we we do get into the first pour rather quickly. We try not to talk too much. Uh, what do you call it? Jibber jabber, Randy. I, something like that. Uh, but today, what we've got is something new from the Bardstown Bourbon Company. This is the Fusion series. And the Fusion Series is a new offering from Bardstown Bourbon Company, and it is a Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey. Uh, it is uh, a blend of three different whiskeys. One is a 11-year, seven-month corn, 74% rye, 18% malted barley, uh, 8%. And this is an 11-year, seven-month bourbon. 40% of the product is that. It also has a couple of younger bourbons in it. One is... Uh, a two-year, three-month 
wheated bourbon, uh, 68% corn, 20% wheat, 12% malted barley. And then another two year, one month rye bourbon, uh, 60% corn, 36% rye, and 4% malted barley. The two younger bourbons, the first one makes up 18%, and then the rye bourbon makes up 42% of the total product. So, um, yeah, there's, um, there's about 60% young bourbon in this and about 40% well-aged bourbon. So what, what is the proof on this? This is um, 98.9 proof. Almost made, made the bonded, almost. Yeah. Almost. And, well, and, and couldn't have been bonded for yeah. the other reasons but. That, that go into it. But you're right. It it's, always strikes me as funny when there's those small decimal points right, right after or right before yeah. 100. Y- you wonder why. Right. Why not just do 100? Yeah. Well, this is uh, a 750 that we've received. I know they've sent out a lot of uh, smaller sample bottles, sample kits to a number of media people. Uh, we didn't get ours from the from them, but uh, it is a non chill filtered bourbon. So great. Why don't we take a minute and uh, and see what we think about it? Good color. Yeah, it's a light golden amber. It's darker than I would have thought for having sixty percent younger stuff in it. Yeah, two year bourbon. Yeah. Now, for me, the nose is uh, a bit um, subdued, muted, and not not real aggressive. I agree with that. Pretty subtle. Yeah. I never know what the right word is there. Muted or subdued or subtle. I think all those work, actually. If I get anything from the nose, it's a little bit like peanut brittle almost. Not, oh, do not, not peanuts, not peanut butter, but it's sweeter. A little, uh, so, that's, so that's why I say peanut brittle. Yeah. Yeah, I'm getting I'm getting a little bit of like light fruit, kind of light fruitiness to it. And I do get the corn on it from the younger bourbon. But I think when you add in the older, maybe the older stock that's in there is giving it a little bit of that smoky kind of I like to say uh grilled corn or Mexican corn. I said that before. But yeah, you've said that before. A grilled Mexican corn. Always, you know, my, my vocabulary is so limited. I just keep going back to the same stuff. But It definitely has more of a backbone than uh, than a, a normal two-year bourbon. So that's, it yeah. is nice to have. That, that 11 years kicking in there with some body. That's right. Well, let's taste it. Cheers. 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 It's a lot better than I expected yeah. with, with 60% to your bourbon. I can taste notes from both though. I think I, I there, right. There is a, there's some of the younger character characteristics in there. And I, when I'm drinking a young bourbon, a lot of time it strikes me as, as green wood or just some, some heat without a lot of flavor. And I get some of that, but I'm, I'm getting a little more of that peanut brittle that I had on the, on the nose. Uh, there's some good vanilla in here and all those things are going to come from a, Better aged bourbon. Yeah, and I get a little bit more of the dried fruit on it. Um, I guess I'm a little more sensitive to the dried fruit. Um, but, you know, it's kind of it's kind of dry on the mid palate. Yeah, I'm not even getting, you know, I call it round in the corner. I don't even feel it coming around the corner on this one, per se, really. But the finish is pretty good. A little bit of dry bitterness on, the, on there for me. But the yeah. finish, I feel, is long. It's... It's, it's, yeah, I'd call it medium finish probably, but it's it's uh, it's not disappointing at all. I mean, it fits it fits with the rest of the bourbon. But I get a little bit more on the on the back end of this. I get a little bit more um, leather and tannin kind of. It's that older stock with that mash bill. I've heard it said that that may be that may be a Barton stock. We sure wouldn't have to go far to get it. We wouldn't have to go f- far for it. There's a lot of rumors of Barton stock being sold. So that may be it, but I don't usually, and maybe I'm missing the, on this, uh, on this peanut brittle note, but that would strike me more of a, of a beam signature. Right. Well, I think it's respectable. Uh, for me, I'm a, I, I think it's, I think it's good. I think it's a great offering. It speaks highly of what they're doing there. I'm uh pleased with it i think it's good I, I, I think it is too and what it really shows is what you can do with blending i'd be interested to try each of the components separately and see if they came out with something that's better than the uh, than the sum of the parts and I, I have a i have a hunch that it probably probably is now, i don't normally you know lean towards bourbons that have a more bitter dry finish like this does um but you know i think i think it's i think it's very tasty 
It's good. Be fun to play with the percentages in this. It would be. Yeah. It shows a lot of skill to be able to do that. Right. Yeah. So Brian, do you live here in Louisville? I do. Uh, I've lived here uh, in Kentucky now longer than I have lived in Michigan. I grew, grew up in Michigan, born and raised in Michigan. And then about- What, what part? Uh, Muskegon, Michigan, Mus- right on right Michigan. on Lake Michigan. Oh, wow. Sort of place where you learn to drive a boat before you learn to drive a car and you uh, you go to deer camp and those sorts of things. And it's, uh, it's a little bit uh, shock to the system to come down, but uh, I came down for law school and- uh, the story I always tell is I started my trip stopping at, uh, in, a, in, a, in Ann Arbor. This is in March of 92. And there was two feet of snow on the ground, stopped in Cleveland at Case Western. And there was a foot of snow on the ground and then kept coming down 75 until there wasn't any snow. And that was Lexington. And it was the opening weekend of Keeneland. It was the Tuesday or Wednesday before UK played University of Michigan in New Orleans in the final four that year. And there were uh, girls wearing shorts and buds on trees and flowers popping up. And I thought, "Um, I'll stay here. You didn't continue South. You said, this is it. This is it. I stopped where the first place that I, that, uh, that had those kinds of qualities. See the bourbon culture snookered another one, didn't they? (laughs) That's right. (laughs) So at that point, you had already decided you wanted to go to law school. That's right. I, um, I sort of forced myself into it, as, which happens to a lot of lawyers. You, you're a political science and philosophy major, and what else are you going to do? But, but who goes into political science and philosophy unless the end game is law? Well, that's right. It, a know? lot of people I, just end up doing it and have nothing better to do. But I, I did have uh, – that, that was a goal of mine was to go to law school. Now, what made you pick law over something else? It's just really, a, I think, an interest in injustice, and I wanted to be part of that. And uh, and I've I've tried to carry that through in in my own professional career, and and obviously with the book that's I'm trying to tell a story through through justice. So it's just been a consistent theme of mine and interest of mine all these years, long before I ever thought I might write a book. Well, any any particular part of of law? I mean, you know, I I, uh, I'm I'm a business litigator, so I I handle the types of cases that are in the book. Uh, I hire I I work on some bourbon trademark cases, some other bourbon cases, uh, but a lot of what I do is involves disputes between companies and disputes between owners of companies, uh, the same sorts of things that E. H. Taylor uh, was dealing with in the 1800s. So was it by accident that you got into bourbon law in a sense, or, or did you enjoy bourbon? Or when, when did bourbon enter the picture for you? Well, bourbon was definitely not in the picture in Michigan. I wouldn't have been able to tell you the difference between bourbon and Southern Comfort, which is is now sacrilege, and and I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna lose some credibility, I think, by saying that I was ever in that position. But I, I had no clue, and really didn't know bourbon by its characteristics until I came to Kentucky. Uh, when you go to Commonwealth Stadium and you bring Jim Beam White Label with you, and when you have money, you bring makers and those sorts of things. So it's it was really not until I got here that I learned anything about bourbon. So what was that first bourbon? First bourbon was probably Jim Beam White Label. It's, on a, it's something you can afford on a student uh, lack of income, and it's uh, if if it gets taken away by the security guards at Commonwealth Stadium, you're you're not sad, out. but you're not out. You're not out a lot. <laughs> and it's solid. Yeah. It's it's solid. Yeah. Right. It it definitely holds its place. It's it's the best selling bourbon, as I understand, and it's it's best selling for a reason. It's, so when it, did when did the bourbon culture bug get you, and what does the bourbon culture mean to you? Well, to me, I think there's probably more bourbon subcultures than there is a bourbon culture. Define that for us. Bourbon well, culture versus the subculture. Sure. There's with, with all the interest in bourbon now, I think you need subcultures. And one of those subcultures are the flippers and, and sellers, the people who are in it for collections and they're on the closed sites and all they're doing is building collections and selling correct collections and trying to upgrade their collection. And they may be the same people who stand in line from 4 a.m. on just to get a bottle and all they're going to do is flip it. They're not really interested in drinking it and in, in enjoying it. I think that's one subculture. You've got another subculture that 
that criticizes the articles in mainstream magazines that look like they're probably paid placements, uh, paid reviews that aren't disclosed. And you've got a lot of conflict between those two groups. And then I think the subculture that that I enjoy most, and that I think everyone listening to this is going to enjoy most, is the culture where we've we've found something that we all enjoy and we share it with everyone. I mean, bo- bottles of bourbon are meant to be open and they're meant to be shared with friends and family. And I think that's one of the subcultures that attracts a lot of people. So to, would you call that the bourbon appreciation group? I think so, because they they appreciate not just not just the bourbon in the bottle, but they appreciate what it can do with a group of people. The moment, the, if you will. Exactly. Yeah. You enjoy it in the moment and you you can talk about anything and it's usually not politics and it's usually not things you're going to fight about, but it can go that way too. And, and as long as you're enjoying a bourbon together, that's fine. I like it. So what is your daily drinker? Well, I think my daily drinker depends on the mood and, and the moment. Um, there is a time for 80 proof bourbons. Uh, and there's not a lot, whole whole lot of time for 80 proof bourbons, but there's a time. Um, the best such, 80 proof. Such as? When is well, these times? The, the, the best example of that was my brother-in-law's wedding uh, bachelor party. We we're going out to some distilleries. So we had a, a bus and we were getting picked up at 9 a.m. or something like that. So we're not going to drink a barrel strength bourbon at 9 a.m. So I brought along a bottle of Basil Hayden's and it had just come out in the tube at that time. So the the older guys in the group, I think, could appreciate that it was, you know, wasn't a six ninety nine bottle of Old Crow, but it was a it's a nicer bourbon. But it's it's eighty dollars and it's an easy drinker. Um, Not that you're looking for easy drinkers at 9 a.m., but it was right for the moment. And by the time we got to Woodford was our first stop. And by the time we got there, the bottle was killed and we were ready for a great day. And you wouldn't want to have done that with anything higher proof than than 80. And I think 80 also works really well uh, in in the summer, even with ice in the summer, um, just to slow your roll. Sometimes you need to do that. Uh, If I'm at home and have a fire in the backyard, that's when I'm getting out of barrel strength. And uh, probably some of my favorite barrel strengths have been Four Roses, Private Selections, and the Elijah Craig 12-Year Barrel Proof. I'll take those any day of the week with just sitting by a fire and contemplating it sometimes just by myself. And I've uh, I've got a neighbor who uh, also likes campfires in the backyard and sometimes just the two of us. There you go. Sounds great. We, so what, we, what We've is, had a moment or two like yeah, that, I think. So, yeah. yeah. So what is uh you've heard the question before the the desert island bourbon you know if you if you were to be stranded on a desert island what's that one bourbon that you would want your I don't know twenty cases of <laughs> to hold you over and it's the same bourbon that's that's part of the test or that's yeah, part yeah. of the question it's, it's it's yeah you're you're picking a single expression so if it's something that I could get that's also part of the game my my favorite bourbon that's been relatively accessible has been a Four Roses private selection of OBSK. OBSK. Wow. Uh, and it was about five years ago, maybe six, that there was a really great run of OBSKs and OESKs out of Four Roses. And I just fell in love with it. I, I don't think the more recent OBSKs have matched up to that quality. But now it, there's some, been some OBSFs that have come out that are fantastic. But if I'm going to pick my desert island, I'm bringing a few cases of OBSKs from about five, six years ago. I still have a few left in the bunker, but you know, it's going to be interesting to ask him, Jim, what's that is who he would like to share that with past or present. If you could drink a bottle with any one, you say it would be four roses. Who who would that person be? I'll tell you what, let's break that down into two parts. Okay. All right. right. The first part is non-family. The second part is family. Non-family, without a doubt, I would love to go back in time and drink with Colonel Taylor. Wow. And, okay. and whether that's a, a Four Roses or whether that's uh, something that he made either at the at the OFC or at Old Taylor, that I think would be phenomenal. The The guy is, is legendary for a reason, but he's got a lot of skeletons in a lot of closets. And I'd love to, to sit down with him. Now, Part of the irony there is I've read in a few places that he didn't drink. 
So maybe he wouldn't be the right guy to share with. But at the very least, I'd like to sit down with him while I'm drinking one of those bourbons and have a nice conversation with him. So open up a bottle and open up a closet door and see what we come up with. That's right. There's a lot of digging to do. And there's his history has been whitewashed, I think, and and cleaned up. And I'd like to dig in a little bit more and, and know the man a little bit better. Any any family member? Um, I I got my dad into bourbon and really enjoyed having bourbon with him. And, and I dedicated the book to him as well. Um, he died this past January. Uh, but when he would come and visit from Michigan, we would always, I'd, I'd give him, pour him a new bourbon that I just got. Um, we, we finished off at Jefferson's presidential 17 year a few years ago. And so I'd always try to sh- find the best bourbon that I had in my cabinet. And that's what we'd share. That's great. That's great. So you're involved in legal work and you're doing so in the spirits industry. That's right. And, uh, you're also an author, a public speaker. You're a longtime guest on the bourbon community round table. And what is the bourbon community round table for those who don't know? Sure. It's, it was started by bourbon pursuit, um, bourbon pursuits, a podcast, and the Bourbon Community Roundtable, we try to do once a month, more or less. And it it's just an opportunity. We have, we have a good, vibrant chat community while we're doing it. And so we, we live stream it, and then it's edited and published later. But while we're doing it live, there's a, there's a vibrant chat community along with it. And we try to tackle current topics. So the, the day that one of the Facebook groups got shut down, we happen to be recording that night. So we, we addressed that issue. When Marianne Eves left Castle and Key, we had her on and we talked about that a little bit. So we're mostly just a bunch of people talking about bourbon for about an hour. Uh, but we do try to address issues that are going on at that time in, in the bourbon world. So that takes a lot of your time. I mean, you're busy with your job as well. But Right. I've got the day job. Um, and that's And the round table doesn't take too much time. And it's, it's one of those things that's fun to do and fun enough that if it took more time, I'd be all right with it. But you have a blog as well. I have a blog that I probably need to post more on. It's called Sip and Corn. And that's how I got started in bourbon writing. And that's really, I think, fairly the genesis of bourbon justice is starting to blog in 2014 on Sip and Corn. So with all this extra time that you have, like what's next on the horizon? Well, I, I used to say six or seven years ago that in five years, so five years from then, there would be a handful of bankruptcies on the craft distillers and I was going to buy a still on the cheap and buy some distillery property and learn how to do it myself. And I was dead wrong about that bubble popping. It's still still expanding. It, it amazes me. I don't know when or if it'll pop, or whether we'll level out, but I really thought I'd be able to buy an sweet Vendome still on the cheap hasn't happened, but that's still a dream and, uh, probably, probably needs to be something for retirement, but, uh, that's still a dream of mine is to actually learn how to do the craft. Now, have you, have you thought about the name? Have you thought about what, would you buy an existing brand? Would you, I haven't gone that far down the, the road in my head yet. Um, but I, I would probably want to do it all, all on my own, not, not buy a, an existing brand. Just start from scratch all the way around. Now, would you source up front? I, I don't even think I'd do that. Um, I I may be, it, it may be a necessity to do it. And that's mm-hmm. what a lot of the distilleries face is if they don't want to sell vodka or gin, they have to source from somewhere. So I, I totally understand that. I, I don't, by saying that, I don't mean to uh, disagree with their choice. It makes a lot of sense to source and get your brand recognition out. Um, but I would... If I could swing it, I would want to do it from the ground up. Yeah. So what are some of your uh, your favorite new craft distilleries? Uh, I've really enjoyed, and I'm, I, I thought I didn't like gin at all, but I've had some gin from Castle and & Key, and I've tried their bourbon uh, that's obviously not ready for sale yet, but they're, they're really doing the right things there. Uh, I, I expect some really high things from, from Castle & Key. Um, the the bourbon you brought here, um, you know, they're they're doing some really good things. I had their collaboration last summer um, that they did here locally with Copper and Kings, uh, so I think they're doing some really good things. Um, 
beyond beyond those, the releases have been so young that it's really hard to know what's going to come out. Now, what, one, do you, what do you think about the the one up in northern Kentucky? Um, New Rift. New Rift. New Rift. Yeah, that's um, a good one. I've only had New Rift once, and it and it was good. I I think it's getting a little more hype than it might deserve just yet. Is that because of the source liquid that they had for a while? Do you think it's really caught on in the secondary? Right. I, I, yeah, the, the, that has really caught on, and so they've that's maybe a, a good example of where it worked out great. They get a lot of MGP. They selected some great barrels. And they got their name recognition. So now people expect their make to to be good. And and it is good. What I've what I've really liked, probably best of all, has been Wilderness Trail. Yes. Their their rye is just phenomenal. And now they've uh got a little bit older bourbon too. Uh we're still talking four and five years for these releases. Right. But it's it's fantastic. It's it's phenomenal, even. And I'm not just saying that for a four year rye or for a four year bourbon. I think compared to anything, it's it's legitimate. Yeah, Randy, if I if I have had the opportunity of tasting the four year old and then we had a specialty pick that it's they haven't released any yet, but some that was pulled from a barrel and it was just the, the rye candy he, orange. He's making just, me a rye fan. Oh, was I, I, I wasn't necessarily a rye fan, but that wilderness trail because if you'd ask me craft distillers, come you know, the, you know, the whole thing coming up, I would have the new rift I had, I was going, man, this is a solid product. I want to see what's going to happen down the road. That's right. And then he pulled out that wilderness, that it's, rye. It's and I was like, okay. and they're big enough that I almost don't think of them as as craft. Right. I mean, they've got huge warehouses. They've got a really nice size distillery. Uh, craft, I guess, I think more of uh, something that's it, that like uh, limestone branch had originally. Um, when Steve Beam set that up, it was a really small still, and he had bourbon barrels that were, he was using as ferment, uh, fermenting tanks. So that was small scale. It's really small. I think they actually claim to be the smallest craft distiller still, mm-hmm. right? I, th- I think that's right. So yeah. that's what I think of. And so uh, Wilderness Trail, I think, maybe fits just into the distillery category, and you just call them a new distillery. Uh, but whatever you call them, that's that's something to watch out for. All right. Well, Brian, we're hitting about the halfway point here. So what I think we should do is just continue to uh, to enjoy our pour. We'll take a little break here. And when we come back, we're going to get uh, we're going to do a little deep dive into your book and see what you brought for us to drink. Sounds great. Look forward to it. All right. like to thank Tommy and Gwen Mitchell from Logheads Home Center for supporting this episode of The Bourbon Road. Logheads Home Center, nestled in the hills of Kentucky, is an industry leader in building handcrafted rustic furniture. Family owned and operated, they take pride in offering only the very best for their customers. The Logheads, and that's what they like to call themselves, are skilled woodcrafters who are passionate about creating rustic furniture for people who appreciate the beauty of natural wood. Owners Tommy and Gwen don't just sell the rustic lifestyle, they live it. And you can be sure that Logheads Furniture will always be handcrafted in Kentucky by artisans who embrace the simple way of life. Logheads Rustic Furniture is made from northern white cedar, a sustainable wood that's naturally rot and termite resistant. Its beauty and quality will add warmth to your earthy lifestyle for generations to come. Be sure to check out everything they have to offer at logheadshomecenter.com. And while you're at it, Give Tommy and Gwen a shout on Facebook or Instagram at Logheads Home Center. And we're back. Second half with Brian. Brian, we're going to get into this bourbon justice thing here in just a moment because that's what excited me. I haven't read a book in quite a while. But before we get into that, you've got something interesting for us today in this second pour. I'll take it away. Sure. What I brought and what I think would make sense both for bourbon justice and to compare to our, our Bardstown bourbon is the old six-year bottled and bond white-labeled Heaven Hill. Uh, discontinued a year ago. And 
I thought it was also a good one to bring because it's been in the news lately with the announcement that Heaven Hill will be releasing a seven-year bottled in bond at $40 instead of the $11.99 that this white label cost. And then also because I think this bourbon exemplifies every issue good and bad in bourbon right now. And I thought it could be a springboard for some discussion as well. So why don't we go ahead and try this this second pour of this Heaven and Hill, and then we can get into the good and the bad. Sounds great. Yeah. It's got a hotter nose. Absolutely. Now, we let that other one sit there for about 10 minutes. Well, that's a good point. So, right. So this was poured literally two minutes ago. Right. But it's still pretty bold on the front end. It's always got a good nose. The Heaven Hill Bottle and Bond is uh, is just when when you smell it, you smell what bourbon, what you think bourbon ought to be. I think you get definitely get a caramel vanilla waft off of it. That's right, and that's a good way to put it. I, you're supposed to get caramel and vanilla in a in a bourbon, right? And Heaven Hill delivers on that. But there's a twist on this nose that I can't put my finger on. I mean, there's a little bit of spice to it, and not uh, not over, not an over. Which amount. one? That's I, maybe that's what I'm I'm getting. Um, a little bit of, uh, I don't know, a little bit of nutmeg. I agree. It's got some baking spice, a little yeah. bit of cinnamon in there. I, I wanted to say cinnamon, but cinnamon usually is a little more pronounced than this. This is a little more subtle, but whatever. But you get this, you get this nose on a lot of the Heaven Hill products. You get that kind of a nutmeggy, nutty kind of. So the color is pretty similar to our first pour. So that's 60% two-year bourbon, 40% 11-year versus bottled in bond. So meaning it's from, from one distillery, from one distilling season. And this is six years old here, but that doesn't mean it's six years old. It could be seven or a mixture of. It, it yes the the rule for age statements is that you put your lowest uh, age in there but this is going to because it's bottle and bond it is all going to be 6 years oh that's right because they can't blend it with bourbon from another season i have been schooled <laughs> no doubt well, but but you're right about that if you see a, a non bottled in bird non bottled in bond bourbon and it says 6 years it could have a year bourbon in it blended into it this will not because it is bottled. bottled. So distilling season, there's two distilling seasons in a year. So this would either be a spring or a fall distilling season. That's right. Two seasons. Okay. And the, the old tax strips for bottle and bond used to state which season it was. So that's why you look at the old dusties that will say fall or spring that, that went out with the deregulation in the eighties. So we don't know that it's not disclosed, but we do know it's either the fall or spring season. Well, cheers. 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 Heat comes through on the definitely does taste as well. This is a little this is a little bolder than the than the other one we had yeah, earlier. I agree definitely. The finish is longer, but the heat the heat is dramatic in comparison to the first pour. It is, and what and the proof was would would you say it's almost ninety eight point nine? I think a little bit higher than body temperature. So we're basically equivalent on proof point, but it's it's an example of bourbons being similar proofs and one can taste a lot hotter. But in a good way. But know. in a good way. Yeah. Right. It's it's not distracting, but in comparing the two, this is so much hotter for essentially being the same proof. Yeah, and, and it's hot enough on that back end that that it kind of overpowers the mid to me. Mm -hmm. You know. This is a well rounded bourbon. I think it's uh <clears throat> It was missed. I think it was missed by a lot of people. It was, would you say it was the hands down choice for value bourbon? I think it had to be. And it's a, it's a limited distribution. Uh, we were lucky to have it in Kentucky f forever, how, however long this has been around. Uh, and then it was only in a few other states. But at eleven ninety nine, this is hands down the price performer, I think, in, in all of bourbon. Is, is that part of the controversy nowadays, I guess? I think part of that is it's what stings consumers and, and enthusiasts is that we had such a value bourbon 
and you never want to give up something that's good and that is a value. And then the controversy really comes in because of the announcement of releasing a seven-year bottle and bond at $40 a bottle, then Kentucky's not even a release state. So oh, it's not. So uh, Kentucky won't even be involved. Not even involved, at least on the initial release. Wow. So it's it's part you just you don't want to miss out on something that that you had access to before, um, and I think that's really what's what's driving some dissatisfaction among consumers with this. Which which I don't I don't blame Heaven Hill for doing this. This was underpriced by by anyone's definition. This six year bottle and bond is was underpriced. Could, and and a seven year bottle and bond, I think, is fairly priced at forty dollars. But could they have shot the price up on this one a little bit? Maybe had it a little mumble, mumbling and grumbling, but not too much, and still kept a lot. And I think that's what some brands are doing. You're seeing some brands on a yearly or eighteen month basis inching their prices up, and sometimes retailers are doing that. And not waiting for the brands to do it, but they're doing it themselves. Well, when I first moved to Kentucky and started learning about bourbon and, and whatnot, you know, I had heard somebody tell me, well, a lot of bourbon drinkers came from the cognac drinkers whose product got overpriced. Ah. And they said they, ne they needed to move to something else. They were tired of paying these high prices for a product that they had bought for many years. And they were like, okay, let's try something else. I wonder, hopefully that doesn't happen to the bourbon industry, but you know, are we, are we starting to price ourselves above where we are? Well, I think we were underpriced for a long time, especially if you look at scotch and, and a bourbon that is, or was equivalent to a scotch as far as what scotch drinkers like and what bourbon drinkers like was, could be $60 less than a bottle, than the equivalent bottle of scotch. So I think we probably have a little more room to grow, and that probably makes the the brands happy. Uh, but I think you're right. There's a danger of going past wherever that threshold is, and I'm sure they have marketers and people a lot smarter than me trying to figure out where that line is to go right up to it. Well, this this bourbon has a great finish. It really does. Yeah. I think it's a it's a good one. It, it definitely shines on on the finish. So good and bad. So the good and bad. Uh, Part of the the good is that this is an an accessible bourbon that was priced at a at a value. Um, part of the bad is that it's 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 happening more and more where people hoard bourbon, and people would buy this up by the case and either sit on it or flip it, which I see as another downside of of bourbon, and it's driven by the collectors. And uh, I think I think this six year bottle and bond is going for forty, fifty, sixty dollars on the secondary market when you've got a twelve dollar bourbon. So I, I think that detracts from the overall experience. So you've it it shows what can be done with a six year bourbon, which is another I think great point of this. I I always have treated this bourbon as as a yardstick for measuring. Other bourbon, so I, I was really interested in in putting it up uh, against the first pour because if a craft distillery can't exceed the quality of the Heaven Hill six year bottled and bond for twelve dollars, I sure shouldn't be paying sixty dollars for it. Now I don't know what bourbon we're going to use to uh, to to do that measurement. So and, when this is reintroduced reintroduced as a seven year bourbon, I would think at some point it will be available in Kentucky. It's it'll have to be at the very least at the gift shop. Will it then be a yardstick for forty dollars bourbons? It it may be. There's the forty dollars is a crowded market yeah. right now, so it's it'll be harder I think to compare a forty dollar to a sixty dollar. The price disparity is just so extreme when you could get this at eleven ninety nine. And then compare it to a sixty, seventy, eighty dollar craft bottle, that it it could be so extreme that it made a lot of sense. If this was better than that, it's easy. The call is easy. Now, if you're comparing a forty dollar to a sixty dollar, well, I think palates can disagree, and twenty dollars is might not be here nor there. And this one side by side with the Henry McKenna bottled and bond, uh, which do I like between the two? Yeah. There have been some Henry McKenna's that I've really, really liked. Because it's a single barrel. Because it's a single barrel. Right. 
And it's also 100 proof. It's also a Heaven Hill product. So there's going to be a lot of similarities between Henry McKenna 10 year and the Heaven Hill six year. There have been a lot of bottles of Henry McKenna 10 year bottle and bond that I have absolutely disliked. Uh, some have just been too hot and thin. And I wonder how they ever passed uh, whatever. I, I'm sure there's a lot of people that taste it with better palates than me, but I sure didn't like it. So those have been hit or miss to me, uh, but that's also a great value to be able to get a 10 year age stated bottled and bond bourbon for $30. It's, it's unheard of. Right. I, I got one with an inch in the bottom of it that I don't want to get rid of because that one was excellent. Right. There've been some that's just phenomenal. Uh, phenomenal. Yeah. I mean, it's straight across. I mean, the, the front end, the mid palette, the, the finish on that. I'm sitting there going, is there for the price, there wasn't anything better to me. But I have a bottle of Heaven Hill this this six year that, that sits there, and I'm I'm not going to open it until there's a special occasion. That's right. You know, there's yeah. I, I agree. There are definitely some special occasion bourbons. Bourbon is meant to people say it's meant to be opened. I say it's meant to eventually be opened. Okay, because there are special occasions, and you do want to save some for a a special occasion for a wedding, for a special birthday, for those sorts of things. But, but do eventually open it. Well, that's true, but it may be the last one I get, you know, so I, true. I yeah, I know I did a review on some, on a Henry McKenna bottle in Bonnet. I remember saying in the review, um, some are good, some are great, and some will bring a tear to your eye. I mean, there, there are a couple bottles out there that are just phenomenal and how they make it into the judging <laughs> yeah. I, I wonder the same thing. Yeah, but there are some good ones out there. Randy's got an excellent one as well. Yeah, that one was just. Yeah. I, See, I wasn't and, a McKenna fan, you know. I didn't even think about even trying it until I got that one there, and I go, "Give me some more." Well, and that's that's part of the issue with single barrel and waiting to open a bottle. If you would have opened that the night that you got it, you might have been able to get back to the store and find yep that true. same no, that same true. barrel. That's true. That's the problem I have. Too many open bottles because that's exactly what I do. I typically open them pretty quick. Well, let's let's start talking a little bit about your book. Um, what what really inspired you to write Bourbon Justice? I, I stumbled on it, and I'm becoming a bigger and bigger believer that you stumble into some of the best things in in your life. And in in this case, I I didn't have any idea in my head that I would write a book or that I would start a blog. But I was at a Woodford tour and everyone's been to, to Woodford multiple times and I'd been there multiple times. And the the week, the work week after being there on one of those occasions, I was researching for an entirely different case, nothing to do with bourbon in the slightest. But when lawyers research, we research on an online database using key keyword searches and you get false hits that somehow the, the words match up and you're, you're reading a case that has nothing to do with what you want and you move on. But this one, that this false hit that came up was a case from the 1800s and it was about bourbon. So I thought, well, I'll read it anyhow. And it turned out I could tell that they were talking about the distillery that I was just at the weekend before. I could tell they were talking about Woodford and the, the case was about a guy named Oscar Pepper, which is not a name that I had ever heard before reading the case. And I, I had heard of Colonel E. H. Taylor, and he made it into the story of the case. And I thought, well, I, no, he's the guy at Old Taylor. And he was the guy at the OFC. He didn't have any. What did he have to do with this? I didn't, I didn't know anything about that. But it was a really interesting case, and it's featured in, in the book. But that's really what got me thinking that there's a lot of bourbon history that's buried out there that I have access to that I can find. And it's stories that they, that they're not telling at the distilleries because when I was just there the weekend before, they didn't say anything about Oscar pepper. They didn't even say anything about James Crow. And that was a name that I had heard. And I think a lot of people have heard as basically the, the Scottish immigrant who brought a scientific discipline to the sour mash method. And he's the namesake for the old Crow brand. And the, the tour guide hadn't said anything about Crow either during the tour. So I started thinking that there must be hidden history in lawsuits. And either it's hidden either because it was lost during Prohibition 
or it hasn't made it into the marketer's talk track for the story they want to tell, um, or it's things that they really don't want people to know about. Because litigation, I, I believe me, I know people don't want to talk about litigation even when they win the case. Uh, you just don't want to acknowledge that you've been in lawsuits a lot of the time. So a lot of these things, I, I can understand why they don't talk about them anymore, but I knew there must be more hidden history out there. So the, so I looked for more cases and I found what I believe to be the true origin story of Maker's Mark. And it's not exactly the story they tell on on the distillery tours. And then as I got more and more into it, I was able to get deposition transcripts and trial testimony and trial exhibits from the archives in Frankfurt. And I kept finding more and more information that wasn't always the same story that the marketers tell. And, and as I talked with other people about what I was finding, I realized I, I need to share some of this. So it started with the blog. And by the time I had done that for a couple of years, it, there was enough material that I knew I could still write about that it would, it, it would justify a book. Well, the first thing that hit me when I was reading your book, and let me see if I can get the wording correct okay. here, was that, and, and so I'll just ask an informal question. What makes bourbon uniquely qualified to tell the story of our American history? I just found that fascinating, fascinating you know? That's you're right. That's part of my thesis statement is that this is the way to tell this story. So that's a, that's a great question, and I'm glad you asked it. Part of the reason is, is that bourbon is the only thing that is, is by resolution of Congress, and America's, they don't say America's native spirit, but that's the way everyone refers to it. It's distinctively American is what the congressional resolution says. There's no other spirit. There's no other food that is distinctly American. And as I read what was going on in the 1800s and early 1900s in the bourbon world, I realized that it tracked what we all know of loosely as the American spirit. You've got immigrants coming over, bringing their trade and bringing their experience, bringing their know-how and adapting it to what we have here. So if, if they were Scottish immigrants who were used to distilling uh, uh, barley, corn is what's plentiful in Kentucky. That's what they used. Rye was more plentiful in Pennsylvania and Maryland, and that's what they used. They, they adapted and they found ways to improve it. And then with the American experience, we also think of the snake oil salesmen. And that played a, a role with bourbon with rectifiers who would, who, because there were no labeling laws, could make a spirit in a day with neutral grain spirits and then add some safe and some unsafe additives to it and put bourbon right on the label. And it was a total buyer beware mentality. And then we became a nation of laws. So we, we transitioned out of this buyer beware, out of this laissez-faire attitude into the nation of laws that we're in now. And some people, I think, fairly would say too many laws, too many regulations. I think the bourbon industry really is burdened by too much regulation now, as, as are a lot of other industries. But we're a nation of law. We're, we're rule followers. But because of what I think people see as the American spirit, we bend those rules where we can, and we use those rules to our advantage to keep other competitors out right. when we can. And Colonel Taylor, I think, exempl exemplified that along the way because he pushed for the Bottled and Bond Act of 1897. And that's and the, the tie-in for one of the reasons that I brought the bottle. It was the nation's first consumer protection law. So before the government decided that it should protect its citizens from tainted milk, which was being tainted at the time. They were watering it down and then adding glue to give it thickness again. Mm. Before the government decided it should protect American citizens from the atrocities that were going on in meatpacking plants, before they would protect consumers from anything else, the first protection was from rectified bourbon. Um, and then that was fo followed by the Pure Food and Drug Act, more protections. That was that was broader, but that still had a bourbon component in it. So why do you think the bourbon captured 
the attention of the legislature. Probably because they drink it, but whatever. <laughs> I, well, that's that, you're exactly right. Uh, there is all kinds of stories about uh, Abraham Lincoln finding out what General Grant drank, and it was Old Crow. And he wanted to send all of his generals a barrel of whatever Grant drank because Grant was Grant was getting it done, and getting it done. So he wanted to to share that. Um, the great compromiser Henry Clay would bring bourbon to to Washington. So a lot of deals were done over bourbon. And I think that's that plus the drive of Colonel Taylor and the connections, the political connections that he had. Um, I don't he probably wasn't too terribly concerned about consumers in in reality. He was really doing this to protect his livelihood because rectifiers could make a cheaper product a lot quicker and undercut manufacturers or producers of straight bourbon whiskey. So he was losing in the marketplace. And he used the law, maybe under, the, maybe we'll call it under the guise of consumer protection to protect his business. And he wasn't a, he was a very proud man. He was oh, a, extremely. Yeah. So if you, if you go to the distillery tour, they play that short video there at uh, Buffalo Trace and it's in the voice of Colonel E.H. Taylor. And he talks about how great he is and how awesome he is and how wonderful his products are and but, but yet almost got ran out of Kentucky on a rail. Well, I think he did get <laughs> run out of Kentucky on a rail. Oh. He, uh, he, he had a roller coaster career. He had a lot of ups and downs and he, he spent money like it, like more was going to keep coming in and he went broke a few times. And one of the times that he went broke, he, he had to sell, I don't know about had to sell. He ended up to try to cover himself selling the same barrels of bourbon twice to two different purchasers. So when one came to collect his bot his barrels, they were already gone. Some were in St. Louis yeah. with a George T. Stag. Others were with with a warehouse company in Louisville. And he literally had to leave the state to avoid creditors. And he left his son there to try to pick up the pieces. Mm -mm -mm. Well when we talk about the, the history of the United States, evidently um, bourbon played a role in what we know as trademarking and branding. At least you kind of mentioned this in, in chapter three of your book without going into a whole chapter, you know, give sure. us the over. Well, and this is one thing that really surprised me. I, I learned a lot as I was researching. And I, one of the things I learned is that the phrase brand name that we, that we all say on a, on a regular basis now and that we all think of in terms of what brand names are reputable um, and Forbes ranks the most recognizable brand names. The phrase brand names comes from whiskey hmm. because since the uh, late 1800s, mid to late 1800s, the federal government required bourbon producers to, to burn onto their barrel head government required information. And they, every, every single bourbon producer had to do that and they would put it on there with a brand and that became known as the brand name because this was before bourbon was sold in in bottles so when you would go to your tavern they would have barrels of whiskey behind the bar and they would have them facing out with the brand name and you could ask for old crow or you could ask for ofc or you could ask for old oscar pepper and that came to be known as brand name huh about that every day is a school day, ladies and gentlemen. That's right. So in the book, you refer to um, small batch as almost a meaningless thing. And uh, you also talk a little bit about um, single barrel craft and finishing. Can you elaborate a little bit on those for us? Sure. There's a lot of marketing terms that aren't defined in the regulations. The The regulations now are called the standards of identity. And that's that's where you find the rules that bourbon has to be. Uh, a certain mash bill. Everyone, I think, knows that it has to be majority corn. And then beyond that, it doesn't matter, but it's got to be majority corn. It's got to be aged in new charred oak containers. The The standards don't say barrels and they don't say white oak or American oak, but white oak containers. And it's got all the other rules for it. But that's essentially where it stops. Um, there's other rules around the edges for age statements and those sorts of things. So to distinguish their products, a lot of producers use the word craft, and that's totally meaningless. I, I think that evokes to me a small distillery with a small still with small production, 
but there are Jim Beam brands that use the word craft or handmade. And and handmade is one that's been in in a couple of lawsuits with Maker's Mark because on Maker's Mark labels it says that it's handmade. So they were sued in California and in in Florida for essentially the exact same claim that they're saying that their bourbon is handmade. Um and to an extent it is handmade, but on another level you can't literally make bourbon with your hands. You've got to use a still. You've got to use a barrel. Your hands are involved in those things. So there's a lot of labeling words that don't mean a whole lot. And I go through in the book some things that do. Um, you, If something is straight bourbon or something is bottled in bond, you do know what those mean. You can find out what those mean. Those are two things you should be looking for, straight bourbon and, and bottled in bond. But small batch, you don't know if they're using two barrels or 500 barrels. Um, single barrel, you can figure out what that means, I think. But it's not it's not defined in the regulations. But we have a lot of single barrels now that are small batches that are rebarreled and then poured out as a single barrel. That's right. So take wood for double oaked. Can Could they technically call double oaked a single barrel when they're referring to the finishing barrel, not the barrel that it was aged in? I think that's an open question. Right. So where do you think the most um, liberty is being taken right now in terms of labeling? Uh, I think craft is probably where it's taken most often. That's why that's a more annoying word to me than than some of the rest. Because some truly are craft, but so many people have used that, that to me it's it's completely meaningless. What about finishing? Finishing is is a hot topic because bourbon purists believe that you shouldn't be able to have the word bourbon on the label anywhere once you once you, f- you use a finishing barrel because the standards of identity are, are pretty clear that you you can't have any flavoring additives in straight bourbon whiskey and essentially you're using flavoring additives when you put your bourbon into a sherry cask or a rum cask or whatever it is that you're finishing it. The rules right now allow the producer to state that it is bourbon finished in whatever the finishing barrel is. So that's the way it works now. But there are a lot of people who are pushing for a regulation that would have to, uh, that would require that producer to just call it American whiskey or whiskey or something other than using the word bourbon. So like, for example, Angel's Envy, I guess is a good example. Probably one of the oldest examples that we have uh, is not a bourbon. It is a finished bourbon. Right. Uh, If you were to stop 100 people on Main Street in Louisville and ask them, what is Angel's Envy? What do you think? I mean, it's just a guess. What do you think they would answer? My guess is they'll they'll say bourbon. Um, And maybe four out of 10 will say rye because Angel's Envy is so famous for some of their finished rye. Sure. But I, th- I think your your point is the same, is that they will miss that it is has been in a finishing barrel, and they'll just call it bourbon or rye. So in terms of legal decisions, doesn't a lot of time it come down to uh, the consumers yeah, pub- misleading pub- a consumer or the public cons- perception, maybe? It, it does to some extent, but courts also require consumers to read the label. Okay. And to have a little bit of knowledge on what they're reading. And, and one good example of that comes from a Woodford Reserve lawsuit. They were in a lawsuit against Barton. And Barton was arguing that Woodford was really Old Forester, made in Louisville. And not this, not from this idyllic uh, distillery in Woodford County with three pot stills and those sorts of things. And... The, the advertising for Woodford at the time used the phrase matured in the heart of Kentucky or matured in the heart of bluegrass country. They used the word matured. That's exactly what it was done. Woodford was not making any representation that it was distilled there or that it was aged there for any amount of time. They used the word matured. And that's fine. And courts are going to require consumers to at least read that much of it. So you should be able to read a bottle that's been finished and be able to see that it's bourbon finished in sherry casks. And there are some amazing finished products. Oh, absolutely amazing. It, it can do wonders 
for some for some bourbon. Uh, the critics would say that it hides flaws, but frankly, I think that's fine too. Now, you wouldn't want to go back in time and have have a bottle with Colonel Taylor and have it be a finished. You would not want to do that. <laughs> if if I drink anything with Colonel Taylor, it will have to be bottled and bond, yeah. or he would uh, probably not let me in the same room. Uh, yeah. Speaking of Colonel Taylor. Evidently, he had a disagreement with George T. Stagg. He had quite the disagreement with George T. Stagg. Uh, George T. Stagg s- essentially bailed him out on the, on one of the times that he went under. He bought out his stock. He ended up uh, owning what is now at the property, uh, the Buffalo Trace property. At the time, it was known as the OFC. Oh. And after he bought them out, they stayed in business together. But Colonel uh, Colonel Taylor's name was used as the company name. Stag knew that Taylor had the recognizable name, so he named the company the E. H. Taylor Jr. Company, using his name. When they decided to part ways, Taylor immediately started distilling at what it's now Castle and Key, the old Taylor Distillery using the name E.H. Taylor Jr. and Sons Company. And Stagg continued to use his name. So Taylor had to sue Stagg to make him stop using his name. And they were involved in litigation for 13 years. 13 years. Wow. Stagg died during it. He out, he, Taylor outlasted Stagg's life in the, in the litigation. But I like drinking both their products nowadays. I, well, and it's, I think it's ironic that they're back together. They're back together under the, under the same umbrella now. In the uh, in the BTEC collection, especially, and they're both sought after bourbon. Interesting story. Yeah. So when you go down to and uh, Melwood Avenue in Louisville, uh, it was a different place quite a while ago than it is today. It had a different look to it. But can you tell us a little bit about how it got its name? Well, Melwood uh, used to be called uh, Reservoir Avenue because it led to where the first water company was in Louisville. And this was an area that had distillers on every corner and cattle houses and uh, butchers everywhere. This It's the area for, for people who aren't familiar with that area of, of Louisville. It's called Butchertown. And it was called Butchertown for a reason. And because distilleries have, have a great deal of byproduct, um, that is very suitable for feeding cattle and feeding hogs. It made sense to have distilleries and and these pens in the same vicinity. And there was a distillery in right on what is now Melwood that the owner George Swearigan tried to call Millwood because he had grown up in Danville, went to Center College, and came here to make his fortune. And he named wanted to name his distillery Millwood after his, the farm he came from near Danville. And we had talked earlier about brand names and brands were burned on to the end of a barrel. Well, he ordered his brand and it came back Melwood instead of Millwood. And being the, um, I think, a um, realist, he decided not to spend extra money to get it corrected or get in a fight with the forge to have him, uh, to have them correct the E back to an I. So he stuck with Melwood and his distillery got so big, uh, between Frankfurt Avenue and Brownsboro road that it filled both sides of the street from Frankfurt to Brownsboro road. Uh, and it was a, a great distillery before prohibition it uh, did not get a medicinal license, so it died and it was torn down. But while it was a big deal, uh, they got the name, the road named after it. So that's how we ended up with Melwood Avenue. So from a distillery to a big green sign out there on 64. Yeah, I guess, right. <laughs> I guess if you're if you're if you're in Louisville and you go to the Silver Dollar Saloon, you're real close. You're very close. Uh, Silver Dollar is on Frankfurt Avenue. Uh, right up the hill from Melwood. If you go, if you go toward the river from the Silver Dollar, uh, you will see some odd buildings with, well, maybe not odd buildings. You will see buildings with odd foundations. There's a uh, car, used car dealer called Bill Collette's, and it's it, it has fantastic limestone foundation 
and then a really cheap facade over it. So next time anyone's there, you will see a foundation that was used by the distillery. Wow. Watched something the other day that stayed with me. Certain, you know, you watch certain things that kind of stay with you. Ken Burns did a documentary on prohibition. And and, and I'm going to preface this question with this information here because it blew me away when I happened to uh, hear this. By the 1830s, if you were lived in the United States and you were over 15 years of age, you consumed the equivalent of 88 bottles of whiskey per year. And that's what they say is three times what their descendants in the 20th century would consume. And that more money was being spent on alcohol in the 1830s than came out of the United States Treasury, you know, to, to pay debt and stuff. Right. So... You know, I guess I don't know if that started where prohibition and, and that kind of thing came from, but uh, you mentioned prohibition in your book. So, what do you think led to prohibition? Well, I, I tried to address prohibition a little differently in in my book because I could have written an entire book uh, about prohibition from the from the legal standpoint, uh, and because it's been written about by by other authors. So I tried to come at it from a different approach and look at it from zealots who were judges and how they were giving distillers before them a hard time. And that led to some current laws on disqualification of judges. And I tried to look at it from the standpoint of, of search and seizure laws that we have today that really, really caught hold during prohibition and searching for illegal stills and being able to use that in in cases but as far as w- why we ended up being in a world with prohibition in the first place i think it's it's a lesson that we need to keep in mind maybe particularly in in today's climate it's it's zealous who zealots who are trying to legislate morality and maybe there were Maybe there were legitimately uh, problems in the United States with drinking at the time. I, I, I won't discount that. But the reaction to outlaw it is where it went off the rails. Right. There, there has to be other solutions. And, and I hope that we can learn from that and other mistakes that governments have, have made uh, as other things come up. And I think a, a nice similarity for current day is medicinal marijuana. I think there will be someone in 50 years who might write marijuana justice and look at it historically and maybe draw the comparisons between prohibition and today's time where we're slowly giving uh, use uh, medicinal use and then some recreational use. Maybe it'll be different in 50 years. Yeah, but I mean, the the effects of prohibition have been so long standing. So, I mean, there are still laws in Kentucky and other states that still have that imprint of prohibition. The, the Sunday blue law stuff. That, that, that's yeah. absolutely right. You know, some, some jurisdictions can, can vote for, for themselves on when they, whether they want to stay closed on Sundays. Uh, Kentucky, a lot of people outside the state don't know, has more dry counties than they do wet counties. So you can't even buy alcohol in some Kentucky counties. That was totally news to me when when I moved here. 120 counties, and I think when I moved here, two thirds of them were dry. So that that's a remnant of prohibition. But it goes beyond that. It goes to the very fabric of how we sell alcohol today. The three tier system, where where a producer has to sell to a middleman before it gets to the retailer. It all came out because of prohibition. Some states have state-owned stores. That comes out of prohibition. Kentucky has a law that restricts sale of alcohol uh, from gas stations and from grocery stores. So that's why if you go to a Kentucky Kroger, you have to go to the small shop next to it in the same strip mall, but that it has a separate door. That's their wine and spirits shop. So all of these laws, I think, really derive from prohibition. How long since prohibition now? Uh, it was repealed. It repealed in thirty three. In thirty three. So we're ninety, uh, eighty five years, let's say eighty four years uh, from the repeal of prohibition. Do you really think it takes a century for this stuff to sort of wind down? I mean, look at slavery. 
it took it took a century or more for slavery to kind of not not the law of slavery, but the sort of the right cult, and the culture. mentality, the yeah. culture. Well, and I think some people could legitimately argue that we're still, still. in in still getting out of that mentality. Um, so I part of that I think generational thing. It takes so many generations for something to. I, I think that's right. It, part of it is generational. Part of it is once you get a government bureaucracy having their fingers into something, they're going to keep their fingers into that something. And that's why I think uh, alcohol now is is overly regulated and overly taxed. And we will forever have bridge tolls in Louisville. There you, there you go. <laughs> well, at least we got a bridge though, right? <laughs> that's right. That only took 60 years. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think the future is going to look like for 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 bourbon and, and some of these laws and, and that kind of thing? Well, I, I think the I was totally wrong a few years ago about the the bubble popping. I like I said earlier, I thought for sure by now I would own a still, and I I don't know if that will happen now. I at least you, won't. You, you can. You just got to have some bucks, right? Yeah. I just don't know if I can get it on the cheap like I thought I'd be yeah. able to. So a, a lot of people are concerned about the bubble popping. A lot of people see prices on the secondary market, and they think that's a sign of of the bubble popping, and they. They think about what happened to other collectors of of anything. You know, the Beanie Babies comes to mind. People thought Beanie Babies would be their retirement plan, and 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 recently, in the last few years, there's people who are saying you could invest in whiskey and that that can outperform the market. So I think if we move more toward that, if we move more toward investors, and we move more toward trying to find value in closed bottles and people who have a stockpile of 5,000 or more bottles, I think we're going to be in trouble a lot quicker. Yeah. Well, I, I know that, you know, there is such a thing as liquid assets. So <laughs> you right. can use barrels of whiskey as collateral against loan money. I'm not so sure you can use Beanie Babies. Probably not. Yeah. So a little bit of difference there. A little, <laughs> little bit of difference. <laughs> well, I've heard people say that if the world was ending, if you had to open up a shop somewhere and somebody had $10 to spend... You'd open up in two parts. The men would go drink alcohol on the one side and the women would go get their hair and nails did on the other. So <laughs> <laughs> That's right. There, there, yes, there, yeah, there, there will the, definitely be a, a market going forward. I, I think part of the open question is there's, there's so many types of spirits that are vying for bourbon's popularity. And you hear about a new one every year or 18 months. Some At, at first it was rye is going to be the the next bourbon and then for a little while with copper and kings getting popular it was brandy and that's sort of fizzled out i think and then rum i hear yeah, people talking rum, about rum making right. a big resurgence age, too. age rum making a, a resurgence and i don't think that's going to take off and now it's a little more tequila I mean, if you oh, go yeah. if you Tequila's. go to if you go to a a big store now, you'll see a really great selection of aged tequila. Extra añejo, right? I, exactly. And so people are saying, well, that's going to be the next bourbon. Everything's going to be the next bourbon, but bourbon hasn't been overtaken yet and has slapped all of those back. And I think it's the culture, folks. You know, it's the horses, the music, the food. That's right. And people opening a bottle with one another, you know. And that's that right. Being able to share a bottle and and come to Kentucky and it's it's a little bit like the, the what you can find in Napa. I mean, different in a lot of ways, but it's an experience that you can have and and especially for anyone who's a fan of history. There's so much history in the bourbon world and so much history you can experience just by coming to Kentucky. Yeah. Well, Brian, it's been a pleasure to have you on our show. Uh, Randy and I have both read the book Bourbon Justice. I enjoyed it thoroughly. We're both kind of history bourbon I, geeks. I, I, so. I'm intrigued. Yeah, you, good, you know, good. I, I I like history. I, I do, and I uh, before we before we go though, it was interesting. You had tasting notes all throughout this book. Did you do all these tasting notes? Because you could do a book entirely on your tasting notes of the stuff you did. You know, there's there is a lot of tasting notes I left out. Uh, I did. Those are all my tasting notes. They're all bottles that that I had and that I that I tried. And partly I wanted to break the book up a little bit. Um, I, I really tried to write it to be approachable by a, a non-attorney. 
And that was maybe part of the hardest, one of the hardest parts of the book, because when I, when I write for a judge, there's a certain way that lawyers write and it's probably not very engaging outside of a judge wanting to read it. So I, I really tried to make it approachable and, uh, and I tried to tell the stories of these distillers instead of telling a story about a lawsuit. So I, I think I accomplished that, but I knew I still needed to break it up. So I tried to include tasting notes from some of the bottles that I was talking about. So I didn't have an old vintage Old Crow, but I talked a little bit about what the current Old Crow tastes like. And I was able to have some Four Roses and Elijah Craig's and uh, Pappy Van Winkle and those sorts of things to break that up. Um, and, I, and I think that worked. And I also tried to break it up with, uh, you might have seen the Beyond Bourbon um, side side notes that I had. And I so I tried to use those to show that bourbon law from the 1800s has come full circle. And we're using it now in cases where Skechers uh, with Joe Montana is saying you can lose weight just by using our shoes or um, or f sugar substitute manufacturers saying that it's just like sugar. Um, bourbon law is coming back into, in, into play with all of those types of lawsuits. And I think that helps uh, bring, bring to light that bourbon really is responsible for where we are today with commercial laws. Our listeners are going to want to know how to reach out to you and find you, where to get your book, where to uh, read your blog. Uh, maybe they just want to send you a quick note and tell them they enjoyed your book. How well, do they get in touch with you? Well, I look forward to hearing from everyone. Uh, the book should be available at least locally at the at all bookstores, Barnes & Noble. Carmichael's is a, is a local bookstore that we have here in Louisville. I've done some signings in Lexington, Frankfurt, and, and Louisville. Um, if you're not in Kentucky, it's available on Amazon. Uh, it's also available on my website and you can just type in bourbon justice and that will bring it, uh, bring you right to it. Uh, you can also get there by typing in sip and corn, S I P P apostrophe N C O R N. Uh, you can find me at both of those. And then on all the social medias, I'm, uh, at sip and corn for Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. Now the apostrophe, is that usable in URLs or? Well, you're, you're right. Not in the URL. Uh, so when you're typing in the URL, it's just S I P P N C O R N. All right. Great. Well, Brian, it's a pleasure to have you here with us today. We enjoyed drinking with you and talking with you. Most and interesting. Well, every day is a school day and we got schooled today, didn't we? Absolutely. Sure. I get schooled every day. I just, <laughs> I got to learn something every day. So guys, I, I really appreciate you having me. I always have a fun time talking about bourbon and this has been especially enjoyable with you too. Yeah, it was awesome. a blast. Thank awesome. you. Thank you. We do appreciate all of our listeners and we'd like to thank you for taking time out of your day to hang out with us here on the bourbon road. We hope you enjoyed today's show. And if so, we would appreciate if you'd subscribe and rate us a five star with a review on iTunes Make sure you follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at The Bourbon Road. That way you'll be kept in the loop on all The Bourbon Road happenings. You can also visit our website at thebourbonroad.com to read our blog, listen to the show, or reach out to us directly. We always welcome comments or suggestions. And if you have an idea for a particular guest or topic, be sure to let us know. And again, thanks for hanging out with us.